Welcome to Portraits of the Landscape. My name is Tim Chapman, and in this episode, I will introduce you to my midlife crisis lens, the uber rare Nikon Reflex Nikkor 1000mm f6.3. Developed for the 1964 Olympics in Tokyo, the lens was the fastest 1000mm super telephoto lens that was commercially available at the time. According to the 1965 price list, you could take one home for a cool $1,750. Just a few hundred less than a new Triumph Spitfire, but infinitely less sex appeal. Two versions were developed. One for the Nikon rangefinder cameras, of which about 48 were built, and this one designed with an iconic Nikon F SLR mount, which about 60 total were produced, most being snapped up by the government for military use. The lens system comes inside a custom metal case designed to snugly hold the lens and its accessories without moving. The system consists of the lens, a leather lens cover debossed with Nikon's original Nippon Kagaku Tokyo logo, an enormous lens hood to provide shade for the front glass and improve contrast while reducing glare. Finally, a rear lens cover, affectionately referred to as the salad bowl, which protects the bellows rail assembly. That's where the camera's mounted. The lens measures a whopping 485 millimeters, or 19 inches, in length. It tips the scales at 9.9 .9 kilograms, or almost 22 pounds. And that's without the camera. Handles built into the top give the illusion that the lens is actually portable. Well, we'll test that idea later. The front lens glass has a hefty 232 millimeter diameter. That's about nine and an eighth of an inch. The rear of the lens, which the camera gets mounted to, features a bellows focusing rail. This bad boy was built long before autofocus, so focus is achieved manually by either extending or retracting the bellows by turning the focus control knob to prevent the focus from being moved, there is a locking knob on the opposite side. When the camera is mounted, the orientation of the camera can be changed with its own control knob on the rear. The lens is a catadioptric design, meaning it combines dioptrics, glass lenses, with cataoptrics, curved mirrors. The lens design looks like this. Light enters the front of the lens then that light gets reflected off a curved mirror back towards the front of the lens, where it hits another curved mirror, which again reflects the light back through lenses, and finally to where the camera sits. Although color film had been around since the mid-30s, back in 1964, the main film in use, particularly for journalists and the military, was black and white. The lens incorporates filters into its design. It houses four different correction filters. First is a Y52, a yellow filter, which would give a slight contrast boost to black and white film. Next is an O56. It's an orange filter, which helps increase the contrast further. For the most contrast, such as darkening the blue in a sky and making the white clouds really pop out, there is the red R60 filter. Finally, the L39 is a clear UV filter that won't alter the color at all. Catadioptric lenses don't have traditional apertures that could be opened or closed at will. The lens usually has a fixed aperture. However, this lens has a solution for that. It incorporates neutral density filters into the design. Inside the lens are a number of 52 millimeter diameter filters, each halving the light of the other thus restricting the amount of light that passes through the lens in the same way a traditional aperture does. You simply dial in the aperture you wish to use and the appropriate neutral density filter will be placed in front of the camera. All right, all right, all right, all right, enough with the classroom. Let's take Beulah, my pet name for my new lens, out into the field and see how she operates. I am testing Beulah out on my Nikon D850. Of course, there are no electronics in the lens to communicate with the camera. So I'm going to go into my camera settings menu and tell it what lens is attached. 
for my camera. This is under the category of non-CPU lenses. Once selected, I manually enter the focal length and the maximum aperture of 6.3 for this lens. Entering these settings will allow the camera to write a few technical bits into the metadata of all the files I create with the lens attached. As I'm most interested in the sharpness of this lens, what better subject to choose than a saguaro cactus? This is not a handheld lens. This behemoth needs a tripod and a damn good one at that. When you're at a focal length of a thousand millimeters, your angle of view is very narrow. Therefore, every vibration will be felt in the lens. And this means your chances of getting camera shake are off the charts. To help prevent this, all my photos will be taken with the camera's mirror in the locked up position. And I will use an exposure delay on each shutter release. This way, there will be no camera vibration during the exposure. Alas, my first photograph taken with the big girl. This subject was taken about 150 feet away. The closest I can focus with this lens is 93 feet, so you definitely won't be invading your subject's personal space. This one was taken wide open without any neutral density filter. So basically the equivalent of f6.3. Overall, the focus is quite sharp given the shallow depth of field. The front face of the saguaro is about two feet closer to the camera than the big branch in the middle center. So the focus drop off is rather quick, even at this distance. Dialing in an ND filter, I cut down the amount of light passing through the lens by about half, thereby replicating F11. But because the lens has a fixed aperture, the depth of field is not improved, even with the strongest ND filter replicating F22. One thing I notice right away with the lens is how incredibly difficult it is to focus through the viewfinder. I'm a viewfinder guy, hence why mirrorless and rangefinder cameras don't really interest me. But even when I am pretty certain I've achieved focus, I would zoom into full size and see I'm, I'm pretty soft. So if the lens is virtually zero depth of field, what will the out of focus areas look like? The out of focus area, or bake, yes, I said bake, not bokeh. It's a Japanese word, and when I was in Tokyo in 2005, I was educated there by a local on how to pronounce it. It's pronounced ba as in bottle, and ke as in kettle. Bake is often a desirable effect to blur the background and make a subject stand out. This lens handles bake in a rather bizarre way. The first peculiarity is what is often referred to as donut bucket. Circular rings that are scattered usually appearing in the small contrasty out of focus areas. The donuts mimic the donut look of the front glass of the catadioptric lens. The second type of peculiarity is what I call boozy bucket. It's where the out of focus area looks like how the world appears inside a bottle of Jack Daniels. After getting my cactus photos on the computer and looking at them full size, it became clear that my eyes, coupled with the small viewfinder and this lens, would not combine to produce tack sharpness. Instead, I'm going to utilize the technology on my camera and use the live view screen as well as the magnifier to assist in focusing. I decided to pack up the gear and head to downtown Phoenix to see how well it would perform in some street photography. Let the record show. This is not a lens for street photography. I saw a mural and thought this would be an ideal subject for checking the vignetting in the corners. The lens performed very well in this regard, with all the corners looking bright. Shooting the mural head on also helped to ensure that the focus would be sharp all the way across so I wouldn't have a depth of field issue. Seeing another mural about a block away, I positioned myself at about a 30 degree angle to it so I could check the compression. At a thousand millimeter focal length, there is serious compression. However, the lack of depth of field, even at this distance, still becomes pretty obvious. Time to take a few abstracts of the architecture. So, I uh, brought the lens downtown Phoenix today to uh, check it doing some abstracts and uh, uh, shooting some of the buildings and the architecture down here. However, uh, apparently 
a lot of these buildings are owned by the government and uh, the uh, police do not like you photographing government buildings, especially with a bad boy like this. So I have to try to find some building where the police aren't going to accost me again. So I'll keep looking. I'm going to look for a privately owned building that I can shoot from about a block and a half away to see if that helps get enough depth of field for a pleasing image. Okay, we're going to test this time shooting this building here. Now to find our composition, that's why we have to use this handy dandy little thing. This is a sight. So you can see this guy right here, you just line up with that and that's roughly where the lens is looking. So with the camera attached, we're going to turn on the uh, live view, which is a pretty handy dandy feature, I got to tell you. And lo and behold, there's our composition. We can fine tune from that if need be. But now I'm going to go to my focusing control down here and we're going to fine tune this. But I'm going to zoom it in a little bit first. Mind the mus uh, mustard on my finger. So we'll fine tune that by zooming in and then by adjusting the focus. You can find exactly where we want to be. Very fine tuning for it, that's for sure. We zoom out and then we should be in focus. So I'm going to shoot this on one, let's look at our meter here. Yeah, I want to shoot it uh, just slightly overexposed. That way I can make the whites white and uh, we'll shoot it at ISO 1000, f6.3, but with the aperture actually set to 22 with the neutral density filter dialed in to 22. And we'll make the shot. And it's on a delayed release, so the mirror goes up first and then it releases afterwards. And we got a pretty nice shot out of that. So I managed to finally find a working distance where the lens can operate well enough for me to achieve focus throughout the frame. So how does this lens perform with respect to diffraction? I thought I would test this by shooting a relatively flat composition set up about a block and a quarter away. This fire escape was a good example. As you can see, when I zoom in on the focal point, the bolt in the iron is sharp. As I inspect the edges, however, you can see that the other bolts, which are about the same distance away from the camera, are not sharp. The next test was chromatic aberration, or color fringing often visible in areas of high contrast transitions. Fortunately, this lens has minimal CA. In this shot, we can see some color fringing at the joints when we go in really close. This one also has some faint fringing on the edges. Time to test the lens in low light. I spotted this neon sign and thought it would make a good subject. Same results with a compressed photo. It was difficult to achieve enough depth of field. However, straight on yielded a very sharp image. Of course, when you have a lens the size of this behemoth, you have to try shooting for the moon, so to speak. First thought is it's quite an impressive sight to see the moon rendered so large in the frame with no added teleconverters or cropping. Again, however, as I found during this test, Focus is virtually impossible with my naked eye in the viewfinder, so this result was soft. When the moon is full next, I will retry focusing with live view on the camera screen. Zooming in to assess the image quality, I was surprised to learn that the moon is not a perfect circle. After seeing so many gigantic, perfect moons composited on the internet over the years, I was surprised to see that the edges are actually all pockmarked with crater acne. Now, disregarding the softness of my focus, you could also find more color fringing at the edges. 
If I could just focus it correctly, it would have done a pretty admirable job overall. Man, I can appreciate the great difficulty focusing would have been for users back in the mid-60s. In conclusion, it's actually quite an amazing achievement for 1964. It's definitely sharper than I am, unless, of course, I use modern technology to help me out. It's really bright, losing very little light for its focal length. And no vignetting, and very, very little chromatic aberration. On the con side, you do need a small truck to carry it. The focusing is, of course, a challenge if you try to do it on your own, just through the viewfinder. It has zero depth of field, and the diffraction is not great. Uh, and uh, finally, the, the Baca makes, makes me actually feel like I'm loaded. And on that note, I'd say it's time for a drink. If you enjoyed this look into the modern use of an uber rare vintage piece of glass, then give me a thumbs up below. Feel free to leave a comment and hit the subscribe button for notifications about my other videos. Thanks for watching.